Okay, well, uh, thank you, Sasha, for the for the introduction and Matteo um, to the organizers for um, the invitation. Um, I'm impressed um, with the panelists, and I'm feeling uh, a little bit out of place because of my lack of um, contributions to actual research on mathematical models, uh, legislation, AI platforms, and so forth. Uh, as you as you mentioned, um, my angle. To the topic and what I'm going to present today is um, is a very broad one. I um, came to work on on Corona models as a science journalist and as a political observer. Um, but I share an interest in epistemology and in the sociology of science. So I hope I'll be able to frame my my experiences in a way that is stimulating to everyone. Um, so in June. Um, I published an unusually long and detailed article in the Berliner Zeitung about a German mathematician called Matthias Kreck. And um, yes, yeah, you see a screenshot um, from the English version of the article. Um, I actually also wanted to share with you. Um, I prepared, um, I'm sorry, a link with an unpaywalled version of it. And um, if I find the chat again, I will post it there. So here you go. So this is a link to the full version of the article. Um, I hope you can see it. Yeah, it should be, should yeah. be working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the article is half a science story, half um, uh, a profile of uh, this mathematician and his co-author called Erhard Scholz. And in several papers and uh, in a preprint that at the time was in peer review and is now um, um, being published, uh, the two had formulated a fundamental critique of the uh, SIR model which is one of the most commonly used models in um, epidemiology. We've actually heard about it this morning or of uh, versions, um, adaptations of SIR in uh, the first uh, presentation by Kishore and Manish. Um, so Craig and Scholz's attempts um, to position their own model, alternative model as an alternative in the, within the German modeling community had failed. And moreover, it had seemed impossible for them to establish a scientific dialogue um, with the government agencies and with the epidemiologists who had become public personas um, rather overnight with the beginning of the pandemic and were now super busy pundits and political advisors. So what was Craig uh, and Scholz's uh, criticism about? Um, I'm showing you, uh, this is a representation of this SIR um, standard model. So what is what is this model actually? Um, as has been explained this morning already, it's a deterministic comportmental um, uh, model to, um, to calculate infection numbers um, at a certain point in time in an epidemic or pandemic. Um, the, the idea is that you separate um, the population in several groups or compartments. Um, that define a different status, um, a different epidemiological status, if you will. So the letter S um, uh, stands for um, uh, susceptible people. Um, that is um, people who can still catch the virus. Uh, I is for those who are currently infected. And R is for removed people. Um, that is people who no longer take part in the epidemic because they are um, unfortunately, either dead or uh, hopefully have acquired immunity after um, recovery. So the supposition is that they cannot get infected for a second time. And um, you might have seen these, these curves that I'm showing you uh, already. It's really Wikipedia knowledge, basically, or Wikipedia presentations. Um, what happens is that in the beginning, uh, the percentage of susceptible, susceptible people is, is, is 100%. Everybody uh, can get the virus, no one has it, and then um, slightly the the curve of infected people is is uh, growing, grows very quickly, and then uh, starts the wave starts to break and go down again once the number of um, 
people who can still get infected is smaller than the ones who are who have acquired immunity. Um, this graph, of course, shows an epidemic that uh, happens without any mitigation. Uh, in this case, the virus would blow through the, the entire population in one go, and that is obviously not uh, how the real world works. Um, but as a basic abstraction, um, SIR is nevertheless uh, being used and has been used, continues to be used in hundreds if not thousands of peer-reviewed um, research papers in the last 20 months. Um, this model is actually a special case uh, derived from a more comprehensive theory about um, epidemics that was published in the 1920s by two um, British scientists called um, Kermick and McKendrick. And the popularity of the SIR model in uh, epidemiolo epidemiology has to do with its simple and easy to use differential equations that do express the re relation between um, the different compartments that you see in the curves. So I'm going to show you uh, the simple, the most, the, the easiest, the simplest possible um, uh, way of, 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 writing down, of writing down these um, differential equations. So you see you have, uh, S, I, and R, uh, their derivatives, and you have, in addition to that, uh, two parameters, A and B. And uh, so if you know uh, both these parameters, you can actually calculate uh, the number of new infections at any point in time, according to the model. Um, what objective realities A and B correspond to is in fact not that easy uh, to define or to say. Uh, we can say that in a mathematically complex way, they both represent um, or are influenced by factors like the contact rate of a population, um, the likelihood of catching an infection if a contact to an infected person occurs, uh, and the duration of the infective period um, of infected people. Uh, the trick of parametric models like this one is that for uh, its application to reality, you do not even uh, have to know which objective realities uh, a parameter represents. The parameter can be used, parameters A and B can be used for the sake of the model as freely chosen variables. So instead of identifying something as complex as um, the contact rate in, uh, in a population, or uh, the probability to actually uh, catch the virus if you are under certain conditions in a room with a person who's infected, et cetera, instead of uh, trying to establish these complicated values from reality, what we do with this model um, is that you, um, you choose the, the parameters in such a way that they map um, uh, data from the past. So in this case, um, provided that you have a reliable testing system, you more or less know the number of infected people from the past. And so you fit your parameters so that the model maps the past. And then you think that with these parameters who were able um, to map the past, as it were, you will also be able to get a projection on the near future. This is how um, this is applied. And um, sorry, so um, this is the most basic form of SIR. Um, there's a myriad of way to, to make it more complicated and to adapt it to more complex realities. Um, the easiest one is to introduce another compartment, another um, population group. Uh, most of the times, the first one that is added is, is called E for exposed. So you get a SEIR model and exposed people are defined as, as those who are in the latency period between uh, having themselves already uh, contracted the virus, but not being themselves yet infective for others. And although I haven't, I haven't looked at the, 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 the models that have been mentioned this morning, SUTRA and SAIR, I, I suspect these to be comparably extended models from SIR with additional um, compartments. 
you can also add compartments for um, uh, vaccinated people, et cetera. So there are, there are models out there that are extremely complex and have up until uh, hundreds of compartments actually. So what's, what's actually the criticism that uh, these two mathematicians have towards um, SIR? It's uh, the following. So all adaptations of SIR models, even those with many, many compartments, they are usually based uh, on systems of ordinary differential equations like the ones I showed to you. Only that uh, with more compartments, you get obviously more lines uh, in this uh, system of equations, you get more parameters can get a huge amount of parameters and then the computational power that you need to solve uh, the equations and to actually calculate the numbers is quickly getting uh, very complex. But so the, their point is to say that um, in order to deduce uh, these um, differential equations, let's go back to the basic, most basic uh, version with S, I, and R, um, in order to be able to deduce these equations, you must make a couple of assumptions um, about the phenomenon that you model. And in our case, about um, some biological characteristics um, of the virus. And in this case, uh, you must assume that the contagiousness of an infected person, that is the amount of um, infectious particles they exhale uh, over the time of their infection, is exponentially uh, distributed. Otherwise, if you don't use that assumption, you cannot mathematically achieve um, this really nice and easy to use set of equations. So um, this is a exponential function. So what is actually assumed as a premise in the model is that uh, in a given infected person, their infectiveness for others starts at a maximum and then uh, slowly descends towards zero without, without ever reaching it as um, shown in this um, exponential distribution. And that is of course um, very uh, far removed from the biological reality. Um, we, know, we know from biological studies that there's a latency period, period uh, of a couple of days where an infected person is not yet, uh, does not yet exhale uh, contagious particles at all, uh, then the viral load starts, uh, the viral load in the throat uh, starts to um, grow, peaks at the onset of symptoms, and then descends again. So this approximation, which uh, is from Craig and Scholz's model, is uh, an attempt to map the real biological um, uh, distribution of, of infectiveness of a single uh, infected person. So you see obviously uh, the difference between this curve and this curve is, is, is quite striking. Um, so this as the background function of SIR is uh, much more um, unrealistic, of course, and that's the point where uh, these mathematicians attack uh, the application of SIR. Um, their own model also divides um, the population into compartments, but they do not uh, go down the same route, as it were, to deduce the differential equations. They do something that is mathematically different. Um, uh, I won't, I'm, I'm not able to expand on that here and to explain it, but what they do is that they develop a model where they can um, include uh, this graph that I'm showing to you uh, and any other graph in reality for um, the distribution of the viral load. So they, um, they model uh, w with uh, the starting point of the biological viral load. Um, and so this, uh, this problem actually that SIR is built on a highly unrealistic um, background function is not something, uh, it's not like a new discovery. It is something that is known uh, among epidemiologists. And if you speak to them, usually they will tell you that it doesn't matter all that much. 
uh, workarounds have been found. Uh, you can add many, many compartments so that the sec sections, as it were, where this um, exponential uh, distribution comes into play is very, very small so that after all, you can uh, nevertheless uh, achieve a good approximation of reality, even with such unrealistic assumptions. And the general sense uh, or consensus in the epidemiological community is that uh, the ease with which you can uh, use and apply the differential equations, um, the ways you have to fit your parameters and uh, to add additional compartments make it, makes it into a fundamentally unquestionable model. Um, that was also the answer I got from several epidemiologists that I contacted and asked them about um, Craig's um, um, criticism. However, uh, the tonality of their uh, rebuttal was interesting because most of them uh, gave very quick and general responses without reading um, um, Craig and Schultz's paper. And if they read it, in general, they didn't really go into details of the content and of their own model. They rather commented on formal aspects. They say, they said that they didn't quote uh, state-of-the-art um, epidemiological literature, that they used uh, self-made non-standard uh, terminology. And uh, one of the people I spoke to, a um, rather well-known uh, epidemiologist from Switzerland, told me that uh, in his view, Greg and Scholz's work was barely more than a bachelor's thesis. Um, so generally, people were saying, "Okay, these are old; these are two old guys, two old professors. They think they have reinvented the wheel. Um, uh, their work isn't peer reviewed. Why do you even pay attention?" So, why why did I pay attention? Um, I I'm going to tell you about it. So uh, and move away from mathematics a little bit. So Matthias Kreck is actually the father of uh, an old friend of mine. And uh, this friend sent me in April a note uh, from his father, from Matthias Craig, and asked me if I knew a place where to publish it, uh, because he knows that I write for uh, various magazines and have connections. So the note was a political comment. It was quite polemical in tone. And uh, in this note, Craig decried um, that the German government had followed once again the politics of there is no alternative with regard to the anti-COVID measures that it had prioritized preventive contact reduction over almost any other public health policy. And Craig claimed that the epidemiological advice that this policy was based on was from a mathematical viewpoint, complete nonsense. Um, Matthias Craig is 74. He's, uh, I'm actually going to show you a, a picture. So here he is, he's a 74 year old uh, professor emeritus. He's been a professor at four German universities in his career um, in his own specialized field, algebraic topology. He's one of the world's leading experts and he's won the most important uh, mathematical awards. He's been director of two of the most prestigious uh, research institutions in mathematics in Germany. And uh, so he's quite a serious mathematician. So what do you do um, as a writer with, as is my case, uh, a background in mathematics? I don't have a degree, but I have studied a few semesters. Uh, when such a person tells you that the German COVID models are all wrong. Um, well, I think that had he not been the father of a friend of mine also, um, and despite all his mathematical credentials, I might have just ignored him like many other people did. Uh, fellow journalists also told me to ignore him, um, and they were usually pointing out the many uh, would-be experts, sometimes even Nobel Prize winners, who had made statements throughout the pandemic that later on uh, had turned out to be either wrong or completely ludicrous. And uh, the public sphere, as you all know, is extremely polarized around the pandemic. Um, there are a lot of COVID deniers. Uh, in Germany, we have this movement of uh, so-called Querdenkers. Uh, it's a protest group um, against uh, lockdown measures and hygiene measures and masks and this kind of thing. And they are continuously radicalizing. And actually, uh, just a few days ago, unfortunately, there was a, 
a young person was shot at a gas station uh, because he had uh, asked a client who apparently was one of those querdenkers to put on his mask and uh, the guy uh, got so angry that he had a gun with him and and shot him so this is this is sort of like the the the, the extreme and, and continuously sort of more and more polarized extreme um, um, situation of the public discussion around COVID. And uh, it's very difficult to, um, to intervene with nuanced and uh, scientifically balanced uh, critiques of uh, what the media consensus is and what the certain expert consensus is. So why, in a word, would you want to give a platform uh, to uh, to mathematicians who are uh, trying to run a frontal attack against government experts, where uh, you don't necessarily want to delig delegitimize uh, science per se? Um, well, I I got hooked uh, from a mathematical point of view. I wanted to know more. I wanted to understand what this was actually all about. And uh, so I had numerous and long conversations with Breck himself, his co-author. Um, I started a correspondence with uh, other experts. Uh, it was a bit difficult to find actually the right people to talk to because um, the matter is significantly complex that uh, even highly qualified mathematicians who are not motivated enough to really get into reading the papers or have no prior knowledge of um, epidemiology are not necessarily well placed to, 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 to give a judgment. So I uh, spoke to some expert that Craig recommended to me. I found some who was not connected to, to have a more neutral perspective. And it turned out that from a purely mathematical point of view, his uh, criticism seemed uh, valid and was, was actually widely uh, regarded as such. And uh, he was also not some sort of querdenker queer or uh, outright lockdown critic. He was not against the lockdown per se. He was not against masks or vaccines or whatever. Uh, he was simply trying to make a scientific point and claiming that uh, the models that are being used were uh, had a fundamental flaw and that he had developed something better. And it's true that uh, in general, the results of and the prognostics of um, the models proved to be uh, not exactly precise at many points in the pandemic, but uh, it's of course very difficult to make uh, long-term projections with any model. Um, so I decided to, to, to go further and to, uh, to publish something, uh, on him. Um, I had the difficulty that I was not, that I don't have the scientific, like I'm very far from having the scientific authority myself or, or competence to express a judgment, uh, in this matter. So I needed to sort of oppose, um, um, different scientific opinions in the article, which I can just uh, expose and, and, and can't really make a judgment on. Um, the three, uh, uh, th the three uh, modelers that Craig is uh, criticizing most uh, vocally are the, also the ones who um, have the most uh, airtime or had the most airtime in, 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 in German media. And uh, we're doing um, uh, government counseling. It's uh, the, the names are Dirk Brockmann, uh, who is head of epidemiological modeling at the uh, RKI, the, the Robert Koch Institute, which is the federal agency for disease control and prevention. Uh, a second one is Viola Prisemann, um, a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self Organization in Göttingen. And the third one is Michael Meyer Hermann. Uh, who is Director of Systems Immun Immunology at uh, the Helmholtz Center in Braunschweig. Um, so, Craig was saying that because of their use of uh, the unrealistic background function, so here we are again, uh, what happens is that uh, you overestimate uh, the infectiveness uh, in the early days of an infection, uh, in the pre-symptomatic phase, 
And then obviously, if this is a bias in your model and uh, you come to giving advice on uh, how to fight the pandemic, you, you will have a tendency to overestimate the effectiveness of um, preventive contact reductions because preventive content reductions is the only way uh, that you have to, uh, to fight against pre-symptomatic um, transmission. And in return, they were claiming that uh, the uh, epidemiological impact of uh, infections that happen uh, at the onset of, or at or shortly after the onset of infections, so uh, at the high point of this graph, um, that the, the impact of these kinds of infections were uh, underestimated, actually. And uh, so this, this is a, <laughs> this is a, okay, this is a scientific uh, dispute. And, uh, and uh, to this day, I'm not 100% sure um, on how, uh, how effectful actually uh, uh, the discussion would have changed if uh, Craig and Scholz's model uh, would have had uh, more media exposure and maybe would have, uh, would have been uh, introduced uh, into uh, political advice at an earlier point in the, in the pandemic. That's very speculative and very difficult to decide because you have so many factors um, that uh, are between, let's say, uh, a model outcome and uh, a political measure that is actually uh, decided uh, by the government and then carried out uh, in a more, more or less compliant way also um, by the population. But there was a bit more to the story. Um, uh, it, was, it was also that Craig and Scholz, they claimed that they had, or, or they, they showed me also emails, um, that they had uh, tried to argue with uh, the other modelers uh, for roughly a full year. They had contacted them in, 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 in several ways. They had even had uh, beginning conversations with them uh, around uh, mathematical matters, but these conversations had quickly reached uh, a, a low point and then, um, uh, had ended, so uh, they were uh, bitter and and uh, and disappointed that their point of view was not heard. And moreover, they claimed that they had been uh, somehow uh, ostracized by this uh, oligopoly of um, epidemiologists. Uh, they had been excluded from uh, anti-COVID initiatives, expert panels, uh, etc. So they were were a little bit claiming that there was a conspiracy going on um, against them. And um, that's also, uh, yeah, something that is very difficult for me to, to, to decide on because the suspicion is that you have effectively two uh, very established older scientists who are just annoyed that they're not getting as much attention as others. But let's say for the mathematical matter, um, what is now uh, being discussed in other papers and uh, people I also quote in, uh, in my article um, have uh, sort of looked at this dispute uh, from a more abstract perspective and have act actually confirmed that uh, the modeling approach of Fleck and Scholz is in under certain circumstances in certain settings, but they seem to be the case here. Uh, at least from a, from a, let's say, theoretical uh, point of view, uh, superior to the SIR model that they criticize. Okay, so um, in conclusion, I, um, I, um, I wanted to uh, reflect a little bit on a few, um, a few points that seem relevant to me, or experience from my research that seem, re seem, seem, seem relevant to me for, for a broader discussion. Um, why was it impossible apparently uh, to establish a functioning uh, scientific conversation uh, between these um, different modeling groups? Uh, many, many factors play a role, and I think most of them have 
unfortunately little to do with, with mathematics itself. I think a first point uh, was simply the age gap um, between the different groups. Uh, there was also a different culture of doing science. Um, the, the authors of the, of the papers that the two criticized uh, they work in, in large groups, they are part of research groups at, at Max Planck Institutes and so forth, so you have papers that are being written by 10 or 12 co-authors. Um, you have computer science scientists working on the um, application of the models, etc. Everything is very, very complex and, 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 and not easily discernible, even if you read the papers, where actually the theoretical uh, elements lie and where the actual uh, mathematical theory, theory is formulated. Whereas uh, Craig and Scholz, who are working in pure mathematics and had a much more fundamental approach, they were really working with pen and paper and were trying to re-deduce from an old and forgotten theory what could be done better uh, in a model today that is widely uh, accepted. So you have, you have different ways of, of, of looking at science. You also actually, interestingly, I think had uh, what I discovered is that mathematicians and 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 physicians uh, uh, and physicists, sorry, um, uh, it's often described as if they were sort of like on the same page uh, uh, with regard to these questions. But in fact, the style of looking at these problems seemed very different from uh, a purely mathematical or perspective or a perspective of applied mathematics and, uh, and physics. Uh, another question that was raised by my research is the effectiveness of, uh, of peer review and of established um, procedures in uh, science. Uh, peer review takes, uh, I mean, there's, there's, for example, science who is, I think, uh, guarantees uh, peer review within a month, which is extremely quick. But most uh, journals take uh, six months to a year, or sometimes even longer, according to the difficulty of the matter that is discussed to do peer review. So uh, the argument that you can uh, somehow outright reject uh, a point of view because the peer review hasn't been finished yet is something that doesn't really, uh, is not really convincing uh, during a pandemic, especially also because um, all the experts, those who, uh, those who um, consult the government, uh, those who get a lot of media airtime and others, everybody was using uh, and continues to use uh, tools and, uh, uh, and results uh, whose uh, peer review had not yet been finished. Uh, so is peer review able to filter the most uh, important points of views? in this urgency where uh, science is sort of watched as, is, as it is in the making and has uh, political impact uh, while it's being done, that's obviously very questionable. Um, I, also, uh, I also realized that uh, there's a very different um, uh, attitude uh, among experts uh, um, in, uh, in relation to their, uh, the, the type of media exposure that they have. People who, who speak in the media and, and take it upon them uh, to defend their, their points of view in talk shows and on social media, et cetera, uh, tend to be very defensive against um, criticism. Um, also, ironically, uh, in this whole debate, I, 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 just, I, I found that uh, some people advocate for due process in peer review, but then take to Twitter and uh, sort of like preemptively uh, attack uh, criticism with screenshots and like extremely short bits of information that are obviously spinned in a certain way while they are claiming that they are defending scientific objectivity. So all these sorts of things uh, uh, happened during the pandemic. And um, uh, another question that I, that I asked myself was uh, one about ethics of, of science journalism also, because um, uh, what it, like to what degree can uh, the general public actually participate in uh, the complexity of these discussions? 
is it actually legitimate to report uh, on such a dispute uh, without being oneself, as I am not uh, uh, a scientist? Uh, do you undermine uh, science if you write such an article uh, in a situation where we, uh, you know, live in post-factual, post-truth, et cetera, uh, era and science is under attack on many different fronts. So is it actually uh, a good idea to, to expose um, such, such a fight? I think uh, it, it is because uh, science is a much less smooth and uh, much less uh, homogenic process than uh, this uh, somehow simplistic idea of uh, uh, a truthful uh, and and uh, factful uh, world of science on the one hand and uh, populist discourse on the other um, uh, suggests. And a final question uh, that also lingers uh, over this article is actually, okay, this is a scientific dispute, but to what extent did it actually really matter for uh, pandemic policies? because uh, the differences, let's say, uh, in the recommendations you can draw from uh, the opposed models, there are some differences, but there are, if you look at the big, big, big picture of uh, lockdowns, contact restrictions, et cetera, they are, the differences are relatively small. And then of course, um, to what extent are modelers and their um, results actually being listened to by politicians? Can you really say that uh, from the fact that uh, a couple of modelers for whatever contingent reasons happened to be the ones who first spoke to politicians and to the media and then became sort of like uh, uh, self, self reinforcing authorities um, uh, has their uh, opinion really had such a big impact on the way polic policies were implemented? Um, I'm doubtful of that. So these are my, uh, the talking points I, I wanted to bring up and I thank you for um, your attention and uh, leave it to you for the discussion.